So um, I will explain the title of this talk uh, throughout it. Um, it must have been early. I must have been on the road someplace early in the morning sending the title. Um, so up, up above is just a picture, um, what we try to describe as the landscape and what we think about all the different literacies that we're trying to bring together for our youth and, and to support them in engaging them. So I first definitely have to stop by acknowledging all the people who um, the work you're gonna hear about today that um, are participating in it. First, our funding, we were very fortunate and still are very fortunate that the MacArthur Foundation over seven years ago thought that what we were doing on the south side of Chicago was worth uh, investing in and, and funding. And they've been a major uh, source of our funds. We have actually changed our website. So if you go to www.iremix.org, it will send you someplace else. But we were then also fortunate um, that MacArthur funded a group um, from Stanford, Bridget Barron and Kim Gomez, to follow our work for um, numerous years, for three years, which really provided the type of data and the insight to allow us to um, radically transform what we were doing. So a lot of what you're gonna see is work that, um, that they created. And second, um, in, we're, we're gonna talk about the Umedia work, and again, there's a tremendous number of partners in this work. The Chicago Public Library, which is a, um, at the end of the day, the work in Umedia sits in the Chicago Public Library, so they're the ones who are truly responsible for what takes place, and their willingness to think outside the box and do new, and do new things was very refreshing, and has made me um, a great champion of working with libraries, particularly in these times when often in most cities the budgets of libraries are being cut, and they're the one place where anyone can go in and access resources. Um, so I wanna start by just making this statement um, and asking you, so if we believe that a society's definition of what it means to be literate is an inextric inextricably tied to the technological innovations of its time. So if we believe that, then what do we take or make of the fact that in the lifetime of a college sophomore, all of these new technological innovations have come into existence? And when I was in high school, I thought, you know, great things were happening. The Atari, not in high school, because I'm not, I'm not going to age myself that much. But growing up, there's Atari. There's all kinds of things. And we use technology in ways. But it didn't fundamentally change how we communicated with who we communicated with. But the reality is that the technologies in just in the lifetime of, you know, almost like a blink of an eye, have challenged how we think about communication. And I like to give the story of my mother, who now lives with me, um, we haven't lived together since I was 18, but who now lives with me. Um, I have a two-year-old nephew who lives in Houston, um, a three-year-old and a one-year-old, and technology was definitely not her thing. But now to communicate and to stay connected with her grandson, she uses FaceTime, and she reads him bedtime stories, and, and they have a relationship in ways that they would not have without that. And so the very nature of communication has changed. When I was a kid and my grandmother lived in South Carolina, we would talk on the phone or I had to send a message. I had to send email. So it's just fundamentally changing. So if, this is, if all of these innovations are happening, then we, if we do not rethink what it means to be literate, not just for ourselves, which is important, but also for the, my two-year-old nephew, the kids who are just coming up in the school system, understanding that if all of these innovations have happened, uh, what's going to happen next? How many people have seen or, or played with the new uh, iPhone 4S and seen Siri, the talk to your phone? I mean, that's, rev that's revolutionary. And that's just the beginning. So it's not like we've, we've made all of our innovations. The innovations are, are still upon us. So with this, we, if we ask the question, what is the best medium to do these things? And if we answer that for ourselves, we still might put the book, traditional text, in the first position. But what about for a third grader who is going to graduate from 2020? And I like the one about learning to sew, because we were teaching a class, um, an after-school program. We're teaching e-fashion, where, you, you know, where you make your clothes light up and do all kinds of things. And uh, the two people teaching the class didn't know how to sew. And I was like, well, how are we going to teach kids to sew? So they went to, uh, face, they went to YouTube, and there was a whole set of series of learning to sew. So them and the kids 
projected the sewing videos onto the screen and, um, and learned to sew. Even the boys learned to sew. So all of these technologies are changing just things that we probably took uh, uh, for granted in terms of what it, how we would uh, learn and teach. So with that said, um, what we just talked about, the example I just gave is much more of, a, of us consuming media with the assumption that someone is creating media in all these different forms. But I would argue that um, it is essential today for youth to not only know how to con consume media in these different forms, but also to under know how to create. And so I would challenge us to say that is a child literate if they're not graphically, cinematically, interactively, musically uh, literate, in addition to textual and computational. So I'm not saying that we no longer need to read and we no longer need to be able to compute. I mean, those are the foundations of everything, which I'll um, hopefully say more about later, but that if, but we need these literacies built on top of it. All we have to do is look at what's going on in the world today and think about where you get your news, your first source of news. Is it the newspaper or are you on to CNN, Fox, whatever your news choice, your news choice is? And so if you're not able to, if we're not able to produce as alone to um, consume, then you're losing the ability to tell your story. So, and if we look at the revolutions across the country, those revolutions that we knew, uh, that we knew a lot about where the individuals were able to push out their story were able to be taken up and to uh, have impact much quicker and much uh, more powerfully than those where the stories were, were shut out. So I'm gonna give you um, a summary of what we've learned in uh, six years, one, one line, and then I'll, I'll unfold it. So what we've learned in the past six years is that new media literacies can be a bridge into understanding and developing youth's traditional literacies because they can provide different pathways. But that's only possible if we can connect across, if we can connect the learning spaces where you spend their time. So we have to think about, we have to be able to connect the home, the school, the out of school, the hanging with my friends, the formal and the informal. Because as researchers and as workers, while we might work in one particular space, youth cross all of these spaces on a, on a daily basis. And the more disconnected those spaces are, the less they're able to pull on those, on those experiences. And even an example, example from our own work where we brought this home is in our work in one of the schools we've worked with, the main school that we worked with for a long period of time, we had our program sitting in the school, so we, you know, in theory, we were connected, but it was parent report card pickup day. And um, we taught a media arts class, but in our mind and in the school's mind, we were sort of after school. And so we were having our staff meeting sitting in the school and like, no kids, great, we're gonna really be able to be productive. But one after one, the kids kept knocking on the doors with their parents and we're like, hello, what? And they're like, well, this is parent report card pickup day and I want my, my parents to meet my teachers. And so the kids kept saying, well, hey, you're, you know, we're with you in school for media arts and we're with you in after school. And for many of those kids, that was a place where they were successful. So probably after they had gotten the story about what was going on in the rest of the day, they felt that their savior was to come over to, the, um, to us yeah, that something good was going on. But the kids don't necessarily see those disconnections. And, it's a, it's, it's, and that brought home for both us and the school leaders that we had to be much more um, intentional about making the connections and the bridges between the adults because the kids were already, already seeing them. So the, if you take nothing from uh, this talk, it's really, and, and, and let me first give a, um, a shout out to you for being here in this combination of people. Um, it's very, it's seldom that I'm in a space where you really have a combination, a true combination of people across the academic, the youth workers, everyone sitting in a space and, and working and working together. So you've already taken um, a, a large step, a large step forward. <laughs> so I want to give you an example of, um, uh, this is an interview we did with a student um, who we had worked with for um, six, um, actually at this point we had worked with her for about four to five years. And we were doing um, an interview about something that we weren't trying to ask about literacies. Um, but she kept, she's a young lady who had, um, how, would, how would I describe her? Well, she's now a sophomore at Oberlin, um, um, has a posse scholarship, but at this point in time, she was a student who had 
falling in love with video and telling her stories through video, and who was moving from probably a C plus student to graduating um, number one uh, in her class. But for her, as she talks about um, what made the difference for her, is she was never a kid who saw things through text. She's a visual kid. And as she learned to tell stories with video, she began to see video as a way of telling stories and as a way into text. And um, interesting thing she said um, last year, she's at Oberlin and she took a, she's a, trying to be a, uh, she wants to be a film major um, and a computer scientist. Um, but she, she talked about taking a Shakespeare class and where you would read the books and watch the films. And you're supposed to read the book and watch the film, but she switched it. She reads, she watches the films to understand it and then goes back and uh, goes back into the book. So she was talking, um, um, she was talking about, she had seen the movie King Kong. Um, and this is definitely a couple of uh, years ago. And she was in the process of writing a, um, writing a book report for school. And so in the middle of watching the movie King Kong, she realizes that the, um, the producer and the director had fallen in love with their film. And there was just too many images of King Kong. Um, just blowing, you know, uh, tearing up buildings. And she said, wow, he just really, you know, what's the storyline here? This makes no sense for what, you know, what he was actually saying. He fell in love with it. And then she remembered, she said, well, that made me think about my, um, that made me think about um, my book report. Last year, I wrote a book report that was too long. I could have just written out the important parts and not told the whole story. Not just tell the whole story, but say what the significance was. When you write stuff, you don't have to put every detail in. Put what's important to the story and not what you think was really funny about the story or what you really liked, unless it has something to do with what you're writing on. So for her, understanding the movie King Kong and how the producer transformed now how she thinks about how she thinks about text. And she constantly is a kid who goes from that. And so part of the challenge or the goals of, of digital literacies is saying that everyone probably has a medium that they're more that they're more resonant with. And if we can begin to allow them to sort of, in some sense, maybe have a first language in that medium and help build the bridges back to the other forms of literacies, then hopefully we can see more kids becoming um, um, more kids become becoming um, becoming um, um, literate. So I'm not going to show you the whole thing. But it was, and this just came out. So we didn't entice her uh, to tell us the story about the connection to literacy. She just found, she just found it on, on its own. So for us, the, the purpose of the work or the, we take an ecological approach to it. And we had to think about the connection between the school, after school, and the community. And we think about trying to create these different types of goals. There's different goals for each of these spaces. So for us, the goal in the in school is to develop digital media literacies, the base level, the, um, that can support teachers in integrating into core subjects. So we don't necessarily think that in the school, we're going to develop, you know, have enough opportunities for someone to go really deep into becoming a filmmaker or uh, a photographer or, you know, a, a game maker. But we do think that we can develop a base set of literacies that classroom teachers can then say, hey, I know this, um, every, every child in my class can do a podcast. Everyone can do a basic iMovie. Everyone can use these basic set, sets of literacies so that I, as a, as a science teacher, do not have to spend two weeks teaching them how to do the skill sets. And what we found is that it's our most experienced teachers, when you're able to assure them a base level, um, who, are, who are able to, to take those skill sets and do fabulous things because they understand their content, is when you tell them they have to teach the literacies that the problems come into play. So if we can develop, use the in-school to do base literacy, then in the after-school, we want to sort of support deeper development and students can go on their own pace based on what their interests, is, interests are. And we try to do that through studio-style role-based programming where you're playing the role of the you're, the, you're on the film, you're making the film, and you're the role of the director, you're, you know, in charge, of, you're the camera person. But then you allow kids to decide what they're interested in and you support them in going down their particular, their particular paths. And then the home for us plays an important space. And that's where, you know, most kids in the best of programs, even when we're able to see kids every day, there's still limited time that you have with them. And so how do you allow a kid on their own to sort of go deeper dive and to develop some of the skills that really just take time, they take time with. So how do you provide self-paced learning opportunities where students have access to mentors, each other, um, based on what it is that they're trying to learn. So our goal um, has been to try to understand what are the, how do you work all this together in creating a model. So that's our, those are the spaces where we try to link together. The core components are for us skilled mentors 
So um, how do we bring artists, media artists, who, who are great with what they do, but to teach them how to break it down and chunk it up in a way that kids understand? How do we provide uh, artifact-based curriculum where kids are um, building products that allow us to critique and analyze the product, and the creation of the product is what demonstrates what it is that they know? Um, we talked, uh, I've already talked about programming across spaces. So how do you link programming across spaces such that what a kid might learn in the after school has some purchase in the school day? So teachers respect it, kids feel that it's respected. So they think constantly about how to bring in what they're learning in one space into the other. And then, you know, at the end of the day, you have to have access. I mean, if you, kids need access. If they, if they don't have access, then it's difficult to do these forms of literacy. So what are the relationships with the, with the schools? What are the relationships with the libraries? And then, um, quite frankly, how do you support parents and push parents to provide the access that's necessary? Um, our work our work, we worked on the south side of Chicago where we had a one-to-one -one laptop program, and it's important to say that the parents paid for the laptop program. It was 100% African-American, 80% low income. Um, and we figured out how to lease them if using also the school's, the school's dollars where the parents paid a yearly 250 computing, computing fee, but that gave their kids access to a MacBook to take home every day, and at the end of three years, the kids had um, their own laptop. Um, people thought we were crazy and said parents wouldn't pay for that, but they all went through for it. Mainly our purpose of that was saying, hey, I can go into many of the homes and there's a, there's a um, PlayStation, there's, a, there's, there's, the, there's, the play, there's the games, and each game costs $60. Um, we had 100% we take up in that. Um, of course, we had to provide some access to scholarships, but not a lot. So I would say definitely expect more and expect participation and you'll be surprised what you get. So if we talk about our core components and we've talked about the model, here's more so our, our theory of um, the activity. And um, I am a big basketball fan. I, I thought before, um, growing up, I, my goal was to be the next Cheryl Miller, if anyone understands women's basketball. I wanted to be uh, the next Cheryl Miller. There wasn't the WNBA, and I tell the story that had there been the WNBA, even though I'm five foot one, um, I probably would, I probably would have uh, changed my uh, college uh, career. Um, and I say that jokingly, but I did have an option of playing, going to play college basketball, going to, um, I went to Stanford, and Luckily, my parents sent me there, but I was really trying to go and follow the um, basketball options. But, but in thinking back about sports and what I think is great about sports, I think there's a lot of lessons learned about what sports do that, and I think what after school programs do and a lot of um, arts programs do that we don't see in the classroom and it's important to call them out and to think about how we can bring them together. So one of the great things that sports do or any, is that there's always a playing space. There's a basketball court, there's a football field. And in that space at any one time, um, what you see happening is you see people performing, there's people spectating, watching, oftentimes people practicing, and in the pursuit of that, everyone is trying to level up, right? So I know what's possible if I'm spectating because I'm watching you perform. I know what I can do. I'm also there practicing, it's not all about performing, right? I only wanna practice because there's an opportunity to perform. Right? Why, would I'm, why am I going to do math homework if, there's, if I don't feel that there's a real value to where I'm going to actually get to perform that math? Right? Um, if I don't see someone who, who, who I think is, is touchable doing something that I think I want to do, why am I going to believe that I can do it? So if you just you know, go around to any, 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 any city, any public sports places, and you'll see all of this taking place at one point in time. But it's not just the playing space, it's also games have clear rules, you know. You get feedback. If I miss my free throws in the game or in practice, I know I missed the free throw. I can try it to get it better. There's oftentimes coaches, there's mentoring, so it's not just up to me to figure out how to improve. There's someone there who can help me do that. There's collaborations, there's drills to get better. There's exemplars, of course, and then there's roles, right? So as a point guard, I might have a different set of drills than someone who's the center. So I wanna get better, not just better as a basketball player, the more you engage it, I wanna get better in a particular, a particular role. So as I take on my identity, that forces me to wanna put in the time and effort. And so this model, if you will, is what has been at the core of the work of the, of the Digital Youth Network. And what you'll see kids talk about a lot is, 
they have an identity of, of um, related to multiple different types of media roles, and they're consciously seeking out who can help them, who, who they can challenge themselves against, which forces them and motivates them, rather, to go back in and put in the work. And so if you use the lens of in your own work and if you look at school, where are the opportunities, um, particularly for the, where spectating, practicing, performing, and leveling up all takes place in, in, one, in one space? Mm -hmm. So the so in a in a summary the in this part of the summary, what the what we try to do for the DYM model we use in schools we do media art classes um, to develop base literacies. After school we have passion driven learning that we call it where students can go uh, can focus in on what their interests are, self paced learning opportunities at home and in the community we try to cre provide spaces um, and this is the work we've done with the library where you can hang out mess around and geek out and I'll explain that later. But all of that is connected and supported through social networking so at any one place a kid can access the work that they've done and access access each other. So now um, we'll, I'll give you more, um, more what it looks like. Um, but this is the interaction model, if you will, that we try to do. Um, we want, we think that if kids can see what's possible, then that'll motivate them to develop the skills. And once you're at a certain skill level, then their expectation is that you apply it. Right, and as if also if you're at a certain skill level, you then have a responsibility to help others. So if you see in the green, there's I have a skill, then it's res my responsibility is to go back into the community and help and mentor other youth. But at the same time, I'm not going to your skills aren't going to be recognized if you're not taking on the opportunities to apply it. Just developing something without using it, no one understands what you have. So this is our since our model of citizenship within within our space and within our work. So. I'm going to uh, show a couple of examples um, um, in context that we worked in. One is the, um, I'm, I have to, the school is Renaissance, well, that's not the name of the school, that's the pseudonym name of the school, Renaissance Academy. It's on the south side of Chicago, um, and we worked deeply in the school from 2005 to 2010, um, and we were fortunate through the support of MacArthur to do a deep ethnographic work, design research, and I really want to point out the importance of this. It's very hard as a, as, a, as a designer to be able to be reflective on what you're doing in the moment because you're constantly having to do. And so you need partners who have the ability to sort of step back and see what's going on and, and to provide you a window in to what you're doing so that you can stop, reflect, and change. Um, the digital youth network in this particular school looks, looked nothing like in 2010 what it looked like in 2005. And that was mainly because we had the opportunity and the data to look at our work. And so when you're writing funding proposals and making sure that you have partners who are able to do that ethnographic work and then that that ethnographic work is turned around quick enough such that it's still, it's, you still can use it while you need to make decisions. Getting it a year and two years later doesn't help with your decision. So how do you put it in a format that you can use while you still are do, while you're still continuing on, on the work, and I'll show you. You'll see an example of what some of that data looks like through the talk. So here's um, 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 three snippets from a, a kid, Calvin, um, as he talks about himself from sixth, seventh, and eighth grade. So we did uh, the the research team did um, um, two sets of interviews with students sixth, seventh, and eighth grade, beginning end of the year, and also collected all of their work. So you'll see some examples of his um, how he was pulling work together. He did not draw, that's, that's not his. It's, he took the image, images and created a video game. So in the sixth grade, and Calvin is a student with an IEP, um, he says, well, I usually like, I work on here, he's talking about his computer different times. Like, like last Tuesday, I was here all the way up to six o'clock the, in the after school program, just working on the video game. Everybody knows that I'd be on my laptop a lot and I'd be making games. So he viewed himself as a game head. If you say, who are you, your game head? Seventh grade, he's made, um, he's in the robotics team and he's also making a, a comic. Uh, this is an example of something he did in the comic, uh, comic, uh, comic life. Uh, he's talking about um, DYN. This is introducing something new. Instead of me just playing somebody else's video games, I can just make my own. The reason why I think this is a big project, um, and he's talking about the project he's working on, is because my dream would be to, to make video games when I grow up. So that's seventh grade. And he's now, he's an 11th grader now. And then this is at the end of his eighth grade year. 
Um, and he says now he views himself, he's, you know, a game head, but he's gone through the process of trying to figure out where he wants to go to high school. So he's now transitioning into, okay, well, what does this mean for careers? And now he's bringing in engineering says, well, I would like to be, I want to be the greatest engineer. When I apply for an engineering job, I would say I've had 11 years with working with technology from middle to college. I remember one of my friends asking, why do you want 11 years of technology? And I just said, because I just need it. I want it, I want it to make a good foundation. So once that foundation is finished, then I can start getting a job, then one day maybe I will make history. Um, and he chose to go to a high school that is an engineering-based high school that can continue his, um, continue his path. So part of, I think, the beauty of, um, of digital media is not just is a kid going to become a filmmaker, but how are they beginning to understand how you use those skill sets in so many other different ways? So it's important that he was doing robotics and digital, right? So he was having to figure out, you know, so in the digital, in the robotics, he's building, but he's also programming. So how, that's the transition from playing video games to now programming something to work, which then leads to, and engineering, building the robot in U.S. first, then leads to, oh, maybe this all can come together in, um, in, 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 in engineering. So this is the structure of what um, DYN looks like look like in this particular school and in um, a couple other schools we've worked in. So in the we have a media art set of media art classes in this in the um, that weave through the sixth, seventh, and eighth grade. Sixth grade we teach a record label class. Um, so the kids run their own record label, and what they learn to do is first to critique media, to uh, write lyrics. So they're really learning GarageBand. They're getting a survey class of all media: GarageBand, iMovie. Um, whatever the visual tools you're using at that time now would be aviary. Um, they're learning how to base set of literacy so classroom teachers can build on them. But they're also learning how to collaborate together. So they have to produce a CD. I was about to date myself and say album. They have to produce a uh, CD. And then they have to do a performance. And what that performance teaches them is you have to stand up in front of the school and your parents. And so you might want to think about what you're going to say and perform, which brings back to the media critique and causes them to think about, well, this is what I'm hearing you know, soldier boys say, but that's not necessarily what I'm going to stand up and say. So that's the music production class. In seventh grade, we go deep into digital storytelling, where it's a whole year of digital video and storytelling that's linked to the literacy class. So they're taking the books that they're reading in literacy and bringing them to life in a, in a, in a digital story um, uh, telling format. So you're learning to use editing and camera work. And then the eighth grade year is all about portfolios and doing the digital yearbook and the portfolio, because at least in Chicago, you have to apply for your high school. And so if you're, if you're eligible to get into the, high, the highly selective school, oftentimes you still need to be able to sell yourself. And so them creating digital portfolios allows them to sell their work. In the after school, so every so that's the base set of literacy, so every kid takes those classes. In the after school, you see these are all the particular options kids have. So digital video, robotics, all these different things. So if you have a parent who works till 6 o'clock, you're at the school Monday through Friday to from 3.30 to 6 in one of these programs. If, you're, if your parent can pick you up, then you might only stay one day. You might only stay one for the pro program that is really of, uh, of interest to you. So it really depends on the kid. There's no forced participation. Um, we had, at times, we had up to 75% of the students in the, in the programs. Um, and then we do something. And hope that's not my phone. Okay. Um, and then um, what we also do is something on Fridays called Freedom um, Freedom Fridays, where kids got to express and demonstrate. That's like the playground space where they got to perform and showcase what they were able to do. And then we had unstructured times at lunch where kids can come into the the media room and work with mentors and get some more one on one time. Um, and then we have our online space, the social network remix world, where kids are on. So in this space. Media is surrounding them all the time. What I don't have here, and I'm, and I'm remiss for doing this, um, is that at the same time in the school day, the school team had um, what we called uh, every subject had a project fair. So there's a history fair where all 7th and 8th graders had to do videos uh, for the history fair. So kids developing digital storytelling skills became important for the school teachers because they looked good when their kids did well because they always were placed as city. So it made them look good. The, sci the, the science fair, 
kids would now do digital art of digital products for science fair. Again, the science teachers looked good because the kids would do these these um, these digital projects that made the science team look good. So you and, and we had oratory, the same thing. So every teacher um, um, had some type of fair that enabled them to build off of the digital skills the kids were doing, which allowed them in with normally not uh, citywide fairs that the school always placed in which made the teachers like it, engage the digital even more. So a critical piece for us in any school we work in is that there has to be some way in which they open up the opportunity for the skills to come into the school day, because that's when the teachers buy it, bring it in, and start building it into the rest of their curriculum. So here's an example of Jalen, who's a, Jalen is now a junior in um, high school. He looks very different, and then when he sees this video, he, he doesn't like it anymore. So, but this is Jalen. Uh, Edutopia did a, um, went around the country and picked 11 kids about a couple of years ago where they were saying, well, what's an example of a digital native? What does a digital native look like? Um, and so Jalen is a kid whose, whose father's a, um, a sports writer. Um, and um, Jalen didn't really touch technology that much until he got to the sixth grade. So here's a little video with him um, describing himself. I'm not going to show the whole thing, but it's too long. But it gives you a glimpse of of him talking about himself. And let's see if I can work this technology. I was, I think, three years old when I first went on the computer. I was five when I got my Game Boy. I used to play that like every day. It was just so fun. And so I equally used my Game Boy and my computer. So I like had an hour to play each so that I would do basketball during the time that I wasn't doing the technology. And then during the time that I wasn't doing anything, I just laid down to chill. Zoe! Zoe! At seven years old, that's when I really started drawing a lot. I like it, it's fun, and they have to have people compliment on my drawings, so I think that's kind of fun. And then at ten years old, when I went to fifth grade, I made my first comic book. And after that, I went into sixth grade, and that's when I got my laptop, and... Then I started using that more often. I joined the DYM program. Did you know your account? Pull it up on your laptop. The Digital Youth Network was really trying to look to see how now the students are really inundated with all this new technology. How does that impact how kids socialize and then how does that in turn really impact how they learn as well? There's a project called Editing Project One. Everybody got this? The kid can come in and they can do digital music production, graphic design and animation game design or digital video production. Why are they going slow motion? Why are they going slow motion though? Kids on their own are jumping across from all these different mediums. So we really need to kind of explore all of them as well and try to support kids to um, become better producers and consumers and critique us within all these different pieces. So Remix World is kind of like MySpace, kind of like Facebook, mixed with a little bit of YouTube as well. So you can go on there, you can post your own videos that y'all make. You can post the music that you're making. I saw you are remixing the song online already. Remix World is a contained social networking site that's only open to our students and our mentors. So the rest of the kids in the school can actually see what you guys are doing. You can also go in and you can comment and critique on what everybody else has done. So the idea is that students for us are already spending all of their time on all these different social networking communities around the web. Uh, why can't we reappropriate those kind of tools in this more formal educational context? I post up videos, poems, and just whatever I thought was like, that my opinion was it was cool. I would post up on the Remix World to see what other people thought. Sometimes on YouTube I get um, worse feedback than the Remix World. Well, I'm okay with that though because I know there's a lot of people on YouTube are better than me at what I do because they've been doing it longer and they know how to do it better. I accept that and after I try harder to make mine just as good as theirs. I showed the shoes that I've created. First, I just took a layout of a normal Nike dunk. It was just plain white, and after I added colors and different like images. When I created this shoe, I was thinking of Halloween. So I put in some 3D pumpkins almost all across the front of the shoe. Have you seen? Do your thing. I'm sit back and get out of your way. You know, Jalen has always been creative, always. And he did that, and his mind kind of thinks a little different. He's very open. And to see him fall into something that can connect with where his mind goes sometimes and to be able to have him do something tangible, it, it, it's amazing to see that. Uh, Division 201 was a movie that we made in the summer. I enjoyed it. I was a graphic artist. 
So technically what I did was I created all the like posters. I decided to use fingerprints because that's like your identity. And after I put them in different colors for different races like that. You can sit wherever you like. The movie was technically about the class, which was in room 201, and how races were segregated, and after that, they discussed about racism. At the top, it says what divides us, so they're all divided apart. And then after that, on the bottom, it says what unites us, and they're all in one circle. It feeds into his academics. He's reading, he's learning, and he's figuring out how to incorporate all of the technology into that. And I think it's teaching him different ways to think about things and to figure out problems. So I see him becoming even a better student mm -hmm. as a result. It keeps going, so I'm not going to play the rest. But you can um, find it on um, Edutopia. Um, so back to from current. So um, you got a, a little taste of what Jalen does, but here's just an example. So Jalen is that kid who's there Monday through Friday. And his interest at the time, and still a little bit, is uh, anime. He loves anime. So everything for him is through anime. So on Monday, if we're doing graphic design or comic books, he wrote a comic, he creates a comic book. On Tuesday, if it's in digital video, then he's creating anime uh, videos, anime mashups. On uh, Wednesday, if it's graphic design, then he's creating anime shoes, right? Um, we force him to do something else besides anime. On uh, Saturday, he's in the, he's in the rob he comes to the robotics. So he's in the U.S. First Robotics where he's a programmer. He, on Thursday, we have uh, game design. So he's created his own version of Tetris using, uh, using uh, Scratch. And then we also do digital music, so he's learning how to, um, he's being a DJ. So for him, all of these things um, come together and uh, end up creating this individual who sees technology as a, a strong assist for what, it, what he needs to do. Um, I'm not, he showed you, in that video, you saw a little bit of um, Division 201, so I'm not going to actually show that. But that's also an example if we talk about a performance space where South, um, a group of South, um, we worked with an independent film company to um, connect, let's we'll say, 10 kids. So 10 kids who were sophomores at that time wrote a, wrote a script. Um, play the director, editor, all those different roles. And I want to say, the reason I was going to show this is about the script. So even though you see a video, and oftentimes we see final products with video, we hear the music, the lyrics, the reality of the amount of traditional literacy that goes behind it. So for that 15-minute video that they wrote, which actually won uh, numerous awards around and Film Fest, Youth Film Fest, and even a couple for, not, for Adult Film Fest, they, the original script was 25 pages, and it went through 25 iterations. Um, with them writing the script on their own, going back and forth arguing down to what is the actual word to use f to convey this particular um, um, theme or sentence. Well, when you see it, you don't think about the reams of paper that happened and the conversations that took place. And so one of the things I think we need to do more of when we talk about digital literacies is to talk about the traditional literacies that are important. Um, there are some people who, when they rap, they rap off of the top of their head. But most people actually sit down and write the lyrics and write the songs. Um, so traditional new forms of literacies are based on top of traditional literacies. So one question you might ask is, what is the impact that the work that happened in, um, in the Chicago school? What happened? So we, again, we followed a group of kids for three years. And um, if we look strictly at their digital literacies, um, we were fortunate that the Stanford colleagues had a, uh, a sample of students from Silicon Valley that they were working with because they're out, out there. And we, our goal was to say from day one is that I believe that we could create an environment where the kids on the south side of Chicago could look, if you looked at their digital portfolios, could look just like the kids in Silicon Valley. Um, and I believe that that was possible. So every year we wanted to compare where we were against the kids in Silicon Valley to see what happened. Now these are just the demographics of, of, of the other groups and so we followed a group 
from sixth grade all the way through eighth grade. Um, even though we were impacting the whole school, the group of the study was just the particular kids. And we asked them, and these things would probably change now, we asked them, which of these production experiences have you had never? Have you ever done any of these once or twice, three to six times, or more than six times? More than six times. At the beginning of the eighth grade year, um, students in Chicago, um, 80, 94% of the students had fewer experiences than the kids in Silicon Valley, which everyone would expect. At the end of the sixth grade year, 84% um, of the kids in Chicago in that year had more experiences than the kids in Silicon Valley. And at the end of the, at the, end of the study, at the end of the eighth grade, we can say that of those 12 things, um, the kids in Chicago had at least done, of those 16 things, had almost done 12 of them at least once. And if you look at the depth, how many things had they done more than six times? Almost three in the 3.75 or 3.68, I think is what the number is. The kids in Chicago had done at least 3.3, almost four things at least six times. And so we had the depth of experience and also the breadth. And if you look at the quality of work, which is something that Bridget is looking at, um, there's the quality of work of the Chicago kids is, is, is on par. Now, one of the important slides that I like to look at is, because um, the reality is that we're not gonna change the, the parent, the, the home lives necessarily of the kids in Chicago and the kids in Silicon. So we wanna understand, well, what role does the plant parent play in this? And so if you look at the kids in Silicon Valley and the kids in Chicago, what you see is that in Silicon Valley, um, this slide might, is probably hard to decipher, but so let me explain it because it doesn't say which school is on top. Um, in Silicon, 75% of the parents were technology, the fathers were technology specialists, and 41% of the mothers, and in reality, for the mothers who weren't, many of them were stay-at-home moms, so if you look at their background, they still were technical, but their job classified classification wasn't. And in Chicago families, what you see is that um, fathers, only 35%, um, these numbers are all off, um, only 8% of the fathers were specialists, and most of them had, did use basic uh, types of technology. And the mothers did use technology in their in their jobs, but most of them were because they were, um, they were secretaries and things like that. But if you look at the roles, so if you look at um, the roles that parents play, um, and this is Bridges' work, if you look at, there's seven roles that parents can play, a teacher, learning broker, collaborator, resource provider. If you look at these roles, um, what you see is that if you go back and look at the difference between what roles parents play, that it's really about the job that the parent has in terms of the types of roles that they played in their kid's family and not about their socioeconomic status and or about their race and ethnicity. So if you have a job where you use technology, then you're more likely to be, um, you're more likely to be a, a learning broker, a teacher, a collaborator with your kid because that's what you do on your daily basis. So if you're trying to teach your kid to write, and if you're a writer, then you're more likely to, you know, do writing activities. And so what the value is in the social, in the in the DYM program or many of the programs that you do here is that. Um, sorry, my slides were a little out of order. Is that the after school programs become those spaces? that make up those roles. So if you ask kids around who played those roles for them, the mentors in the, in the after school program took on the roles as the teachers, the learning brokers, the supporters and stuff. And how you see that is that when, the kid, when you ask them, how did you, who taught you, how did you learn this? In Chicago, um, over what, over 70, 60% of kids say I learned it in the after school space. In Silicon Valley, over 70% of them, the kids say that they learned it from, um, the, from the fathers. So I think the important point here is that, yeah, the reality is we're not going to go to the South Side and have all the parents, fathers, and mothers become specialists in technology, but you can create these ecologies where someone can play those roles and provide those supports. And if you could figure out the structure of doing that, then you have the potential of closing those divides. So that's where we get to the different pathways. It doesn't necessarily have to be in your home environment if we understand the importance of having these roles and be systematic in terms of how people are playing those roles as they move across the home and school and after school, then we can get to a point where kids, wherever they live, can develop some of these same sets of expertise. And they're aware of where they're learning them from because they're very articulate who's teaching them and who isn't. So um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about you media. What is the time I have about how much, how much 10 minutes or what's the? Okay, so we had done this work on the south side and we, you know, we felt we had a model and we were successful, but the reality is um, that was touching a small group of kids. Um, and if we're really gonna have impact, we need to think about how to, how to serve more. 
And we also, the, the good side of the story is we had that impact. The sad part of the story is when they left that environment, and went to high school where they all went to across the city of Chicago. You might have three kids from the middle school in the same high school. When they went into their high schools where that social capital of digital literacies was not supported or not even necessarily respected, then they quickly go back into, if you follow them on Facebook, you see what they're doing. Now, many of them are still doing digital because we're, we're, we have a longitudinal study following them, but they're not putting in the same effort because they, if we go back to having the that space, that playground space that's important, they don't have that space anymore. And so where are they seeing what's next and what's possible? So they stopped to some degree. So we started working with the Chicago Public Library, supported again by MacArthur, to build up on the work of Mimi Ito, who had, had done, it's the largest ethnographic work of kids' digital literacies. And in her work, she says there's three king things kids do with digital literacy. They hang out, which we all know about Facebook and things like that. They mess around, so they do dabble in trying to learn things. And then some kids really do geek out. So if you look at fan fiction sites, all kinds of places, uh, deviant art, all kinds of places where kids are really learning how to develop them, so their, their, their literacies, those are kids who are geeking out. But in her work, only she found that only 10% of kids are doing that. So the question is, can you change those numbers and can you get more kids in doing that? So our attempt to do that was to create this Umedia library space, which is downtown Chicago, easily accessible by anyone, by public transportation. And could we take the library, which is a space that's open to anyone, and create a teen-only space where teens would want to come to the library um, to connect and to learn and develop their digital skills and to put them into action. So Umedia is only three, I think it's in three years old and already it's going to be scaled to at least 30 locations across the city, across the country. So hopefully um, someone in Minnesota applied for one of the uh, Learning Labs grants. So what we've done is we've taken the DYM program and put it into libraries. But the difference is we, kids can come in and leave anytime they want. So they can come into a library, come to a workshop today or not. It's not like they register for a year-long series of digital video, which is a very challenging thing. So um, the goal was to say, this isn't what the library should look like, and the answer isn't just putting in a laptop, um, because then there's no social. What you want is to create an environment where a library looks like this. You have kids reading books, they're playing games, everything doesn't have to be digital. They're using technology collaboratively. They're developing their music skills. They're in workshops. Um, there's a recording studio. Now, what's really interesting, and you have to understand Chicago to understand some of these pictures, this is probably the only place in Chicago where you're going to see kids of different socioeconomic and races working together collaboratively on their own um, and across grades. So you might have a, a ninth grader working with uh, a 12th grader. So I'm sure like here, the thing the kids like the most is that it's a library space for them only for them. They do not have to bring their little brothers and sisters in, and in fact, they can't. So the fact that it's a place to be, they like, but then the question is, can we get them beyond just being there and actually actually creating? The layout of the library was intentionally designed such that um, to the um, to the front is a hanging out. You come in through these doors right to the left of it. You can eat food. There's a performance space there. Um, do your homework. In the middle um, is more of a space design where you can hang, you know, hang out, mess around, have more working groups, and then to the um, end was designed for, for geeking out. Now, these are terms that we use, kids use none of these terms, and kids do whatever across the entire space. So, you know, how it was designed is not how it's, how it's actually used. What it looks like, yes, book circulation is higher than it's ever been, and that uh, the youth book circulation is higher than it's ever been. That um, this 5,000 square foot space, um, the book circulation there equals the circulation at many of the, uh, the branch libraries. Um, you actually do see kids bringing in instruments and sitting down and collaborating together. Um, you have the geeking out, and then you have an example of a program which we call Hamago All-in-One Space. So this is the, the, the stage space, Lyricist Loft, which happens every Wednesday um, and gets like 130 kids around the city where they come in. It's an open mic session where kids perform. Um, sing, rap, the DJ, they're playing a the DJ, they're playing a the videographer, they do all of this work. Now the example with this, which is very important, is before we had the Lyricist Loft, uh, we went to Louder Than a Bomb um, Poetry, we competed, and we came in last in the city. The year after we did implement Lyricist Loft, we won it in the city and we went to the national competition, mainly because 
with the existence of lyricist loft in the city, the kids on the poetry team constantly were performing and comparing themselves to others. So they came to workshops to get better and better and better. They had the opportunity to present their work, which made them get better and better and better. So all those little performance spaces built up for them developing uh, connections and collaborations to do well. We also do something called One Book, One Chicago, which is a sh Chicago thing where you take a book and you read it. And normally what happens in the city for us older folks is you read the book and you have book discussions. What happens for the students is they read the books and they turn them into digital artifacts. So uh, we did the Planet Chicago last year, which was, uh, the year, yeah, which was a really big um, project. So then they became, um, there was a digital city planner project. Um, where students created their own plan for their community because the plan of Chicago only uh, took place in downtown. So they created uh, proposals that uh, the mayor saw some of them and actually gave kids plots of land to turn it into effect. It went over well that it was presented at the White House and actually made it to down, the example of the project made it to the UN World Habitat. Um, students are also taking gaming which playing games, but now they have a library of games where they're now doing their own um, um, podcasts on what works in games. And um, then creating, uh, they of course play games, but also creating their views of what new game machines can be. I'm gonna show you one example of what this looks like. And, and, and they're reading tough books. Uh, I don't know how many of you have read any Toni Morrison books. I took a, uh, uh, Toni Morrison, read her books in college, and I still have to go back and try to, it's hard for me to, to read, I have to read them over and over again. So we just had um, A Mercy, uh, which kids read for um, last, last six months ago, and they held their own showcase. And so I want to show you um, an example of what, what you media looks like in action. Um, and so again, the book, they did videos, music, fan fictions, photography, spoken word, oral histories re related to the book. So here is an example of, of what you media looks like in action. This is a blog site that contains all the work that the students created, but here's a, um, a snippet of a video. great to see like all these students come together across medium, uh, work with different mentors and uh, the work that they've been producing has been amazing. We did alternative color covers for the book because the original cover, um, it was good but I figured like um, it didn't say enough about the story so we decided to make alternative covers that we thought kind of represented the stories. When I was reading the book, I read the line, as I live and breathe a slave by choice. And this picture kind of like embodies self-enslavement. The whole instrumental is all percussion, all like tr really tribal, African sounding with marimba and xylophone and all that. What does it mean to be a black teenager, my ancestors to the white? To make that connection was just a dream kind of, to be able to read a book that you wouldn't normally read and then it has so much of an effect on you that you can put your own musical emphasis on it. What I'm doing right now is uh, putting together a, a, um, a sort of a beat situation more so that someone could put uh, lyrics to it. I'm supposed to be recording pretty soon. Um, Brother Mike, is, uh, he tries to record poems all the time, but I'm a little shy. Are you more comfortable holding a paper here? Because what happens is your mouth is pointing this way. Okay. If you hold it up, it'd be a little better. I think a lot of the kids are not used to this, and so I feel like it's part of my job to help them understand what this is all about and why it's here. Um, like the young lady who was just here, Dominique, she said that she's afraid. Like, Brother Mike is always asking her to come into the studio and record, and this was the first time. Salted tears dancing in scrapes sting like ringing slaps. They dance to the rhythm you pound into drums. Skin stretched taut over dismantled jaws and collarbones, we dance to music. I wrote a poem um, as if I were the character Florence, and so he's gonna be singing like I 
he's gonna be singing sort of like lyrics that I wrote. Um, I wrote the poem and then afterwards there's like a little song. So he's gonna be singing that as well as um, producing the beat most likely. Like Master told Mama, it'll hurt at first, but give it time. You will love the product of this raping. My mama named me Florence so I wouldn't wither under the harshness of a man. There's a strength in my decrepitness, a fragment of your pedigree couldn't muster. It's been cool to see how much can come from one book and how like a vast array of work has come from this one book. Not only are they reading books, but they're you know, making these great projects, uh, these media projects around books. I think it the special the special piece for that for me is that it's something that can be replicated in schools uh, and I hope literacy teachers you know take heed and you know open up the doors of what is possible uh, with students learning this media hopefully maybe you know in the future give them credit in their classrooms for what they're doing in spaces like you media I like to um, stop there because you the the picture I love in that is the example of you saw the book with all the clips, I mean, all the uh, notes. So they read the books, and this is something they do uh, after school on their, on, their, on their own because the engagement of having their work seen and shown to others motivates them to put in the time. One of the um, uh, young people who actually, he made a video at the same time he was reading Pride and Prejudice for, uh, for school, and the assignment in, in school was to find every, every word you don't understand, get a big poster board, and put the word in the definition on the poster board. So sitting on the floor at U Media was this big poster board that he had to do. But while he's spending all this time making this experimental video that he called about what is it like to feel to be to be to be a slave and never to be awoke, and showing repeating the day over and over again, which is a fascinating video, which he's putting his time in. But that was the design of an activity that he found meaningful. Whereas reading the book, so it's not about the book that was the issue, it's more about the activity structure around it. So I want to close with showing two examples of, of, of how, what this all leads to, and I don't expect you to be able to read this. Um, but so what we've shown is sort of like snippets of, okay, a kid is doing this project and this project, but those snippets have to come together to add up to something. And the hope is that over a period of time, longitudinal time, that you do begin to get change in kids such that they do have the skill sets that enables them to, um, um, to be successful. So here is us looking at, um, this is real data from our social network where we're looking at one young lady's two years of participation in U Media. She views herself as a photographer. So what you have across the top where it says participation in projects, these are all the project groups that she participated in at um, both at U Media and in some outside spaces. So she was, you know, she would participate in something for a month or two months, and then if she didn't like it, she moved on to something else. Sometimes she had long participation. What you see down in the with the with the bubble graphs is really all the media that she uploaded to the social network in the time frame. And the bigger the graph is, the more, the bubble, the more she uploaded in that particular day. And so you see that she did a lot of comments. She also uploaded a lot of photography. She viewed herself as a photographer. She She's not uploading music and really videos, right? And so over a long period of time, she amassed over a lot of work. Now, what's also important is that um, to the chart to the right is not just that she uploaded work. So 42% of her photo, 42% of her time in the social network was uploading videos, but she also spent 29% of her time in the network was looking at others' work. So because there was a space where she can see what others were doing, she was looking at the photographs, the photography of other students, which actually oftentimes motivated her to do more. So it's not just publishing one's work, but it's also having opportunities to see what others are doing that motivates, motivates students. So the infrastructure that it takes to do this, I just have to say, so our work, our combination of people who work with us, um, we have tool designers, academics, funders, need funders, uh, teachers, um, commercial partners, um, information strategists, so whoever, people who can do that graph that you just saw that I can't, learning scientists, and tons of mentors. So we, none of this can happen without the digital mentors and, and figuring out how to create communities for them. Um, and create new job opportunities and classifications because oftentimes if you do digital work it's been something that you've learned to do on your own and there really aren't spaces where you can have continual development so figuring out what are the what are the what's the developmental 
pipeline. So those who really want to work with students and have these digital skill sets can develop their skill sets and, um, and make progress. Social Learning Network, um, which is a, 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 we started off with just our own version, but we now have a tool that others are using to use their, create their own social network that they can use in their spaces. Um, I can say more about that later if people are interested in. Um, it has these components, assessments, an incentive system, the ability to collaborate and give credit for collaborations. You have to cite your sources, structure debates, um, ranking systems, and mentors. Um, um, say more about that later. Um, and then I want to close with, I think the challenge is um, really trying to, so UMedia is, I would say in some nature, is successful. And it's successful for a type of kid, a kid who sort of has an idea of what they want to do and they come into the space. But I think the biggest challenge that you're facing and probably we're facing is what do you do for the kid who doesn't necessarily know that there are resources out there to to support their interests, who haven't necessarily come up in environments that they're familiar with that. So what we're trying to do now is think of ways of understanding what are the barriers from preventing kids to engage in opportunities. So one is having access to different kinds of ex experiences, um, having understanding what the different motivations are, and making visible what happens. So then how do we then, if we understand what are the barriers, barriers how do we make these things available to them. So how do you do more peer-based support? So come with you and your five friends. I mean, one thing, you know, group on pushes things to you. So how do you begin to push opportunities to kids that make it easier for them to engage um, than having to just uh, do it on their own? How do you provide just-in-time um, examples or push narratives to them of other kids who are doing things like them? Um, and so we're trying to figure that out in a systematic way by doing things such as taking data from what kids, what they're participating in, what they're doing in social network spaces, and then understanding what's available in the city and pushing out opportunities to say, hey, you've done two videos. Um, we've seen you upload it. You know about this one video program that exists on Saturdays. Um, so those are some of the things we're playing with. And we're also doing a badge system. Um, if we can figure out how to help kids who have multiple different interests. So some kids come in because they want to be something. Some kids want to do something. And some kids want to make something. So I might want to be a filmmaker, I want to make a film, or I just like using a camera. So those are different ways in. And how do you support kids in all of those different pathways but find ways to engage and motivate them? So that's another thing we're working on. And then finally, that same, and how we're doing that, and definitely don't read this, but that same scenario I showed you, we've now gone back and figured out what would have been the badges along her pathway that, we could have, that she could have been awarded that also would have been as a signal to her and to others that she's making progress. So we're now implementing a badge system around digital media and literacy such that kids can know what's possible um, and make it more clear and easier for them to level up. And I will stop there. <laughs>